Hello and welcome everyone, both our virtual attendees and those of you in the room. Today we have the honor of having uh, Dr. Daniel Hickey here uh, once again for a COIL conversation. Uh, Dr. Dan Hickey is a professor and program coordinator with the Learning Sciences Program at Indiana University. And more importantly for our discussion today, uh, Dr. Hickey is consistently been a prominent voice in the thinking behind and the research of open digital badges. This includes his current role as Director of Badges for Open edX and Beyond Project, aimed at expanding the use of digital badges in higher education. Dan joined us roughly a year ago, I think last December, uh, to give us a state of the field and uh, to join us today to provide an update uh, of Mint and his latest thoughts on its place in higher education in the higher education landscape. So I want to welcome uh, Dr. Dan Hickey here and please. Thank you, Brad. I'm happy to be here. I want to thank Rick Dushel for inviting me here to uh, visit as well. Um, it's just really an honor to be here. So let me start by thanking my sponsors. Um, I have been blessed with the support of the MacArthur Foundation since 2007. Uh, and it's really been an honor because uh, it's allowed me to really be on the ground floor to watch this thing literally from the start. Um, to, to be from the very beginning and see this thing get constructed from, from out of nothing was, was quite a, a marvelous thing to watch. Uh, to see, frankly, Connie mm -hmm. Owl was behind much of it to, to be at the Carnegie Foundation in 2010 when uh, Mozilla teamed up with Peer-to-Peer -peer University and recognized that, that at a place like PDPU and at many of the new programs that MacArthur was funding as part of their digital media and learning initiative, there was no way to recognize the, the, these huge amounts of learning that were occurring, in many cases, sort of out there in the wild. And um, to, to sort of see this thing unfold and to come to where it is, uh, really, in just four short years, has been a pretty marvelous thing to see. So I'm really fortunate. Uh, to have the opportunity. And uh, also, Google has been very helpful. I think I left Indiana University. They've actually funded some of the work that I'll talk about today as well. So I don't think I need to do the what are your digital badges thing, thank God. Um, it, you know, everybody pretty much gets the idea. Digital badges are different than conventional static credentials, right? A PDF is not a digital document, right? Getting your, you know, requesting your, those are not digital. They're analog documents. And uh, digital badges, right, they contain, not only can they contain uh, detailed claims, specific claims of competency, they can contain evidence supporting those claims. And links to more evidence can, can circulate freely uh, on the internet, social networks. And that's, you know, that's the internet. And that changes a lot of things. And it, it helps with a lot of promise that you would be able to connect issuers and backpacks and that people would curate their work. And really excited in 2011 when this thing was rolled out, and in 2012 when the digital media the funding initiative began. Where are we at? Well, it's pretty clear even the most ardent advocates would still have to agree that employers and admissions officials still are not, you know, accepting badges as as valid, convincing evidence of competencies. Um, and I think in retrospect, I don't think we should be surprised about that. Because if you think about it for just a second, the existing credentialing system grew up alongside systems for education, employment, training. So there's a lot of very complicated, tangled webs of relationships. Many of those relationships are tacit. Some of them run counter to official policy in terms of employment and stuff. So it's certainly many of us never expect that just to replace the existing system. But even supplementing the existing system, which is it's really tied together in many, many ways, we need to be a little patient. At the end of my talk, I'll talk about some current developments that are taking place. It does look that, that things are moving along fine, but we still have something to learn about how to use these digital badges. So I want to start by talking about the lessons learned from the 2012 Badges for Lifelong Learning Initiative. So. It, 600 proposals were submitted. They ended up funding 29 very diverse projects to do the thing that had never been done before, which is build a, a, a digital an open digital badge system, while the standards for the digital system were still being created. So this was a very ambitious, a very frankly messy project. Um, I was pleased to uh, be funded in 2012 to some team to study what what can we learn from looking very carefully and closely and systematically and objectively? My job was not 
helping these projects. My job was standing back and saying, what do we learn from these projects? And Mimi Ito and I had a long talk about this. I'm a design researcher. I mess with things. So it was a little hard for me to turn my head around a little bit and say, no, it's not your job to help these projects succeed. It's your job to document why they fail if they fail. So um, these were 30 very diverse projects, uh, really covering the gamut, um, doing something, like I said, had never been done before. So um, what you see here is how diverse they really they were in terms of earners, standards, setting, and accreditation. Uh, these 29 projects really covered the entire formal to informal landscape, uh, youth, adults, um, it's a very different project. What we were after was not what works. We weren't after best practices. We were trying to capture what Aristotle called phrenesis, practical wisdom, the contextual and value-laden knowledge are really like Rich Halverson's arguments around this notion. He talks about artifact-based phrenetic narratives. If you think about it, badges serve as the anthropological notion of boundary objects. They serve as boundary objects in two ways. One is, as credentials, they can circulate from different audiences and maintain their meaning and, 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 and serve different functions as they travel across the internet. In terms of an innovation, they also have a lot of potential because the practices that work in one setting might work in another setting. So what I was trying to do with this project, in the same way that badges function, tended to function in this way, carrying credential information, for instance, communicating that information between employers, educators, and learners, there's a lot of potentials for badges to do that among different kinds of innovators looking to use this. So that's what we were after here. The way we did that was by first identifying but what are the functions of badges? Not the purposes, but the functions of badges, building on, on my arguments and assessment. Badges, first and foremost, are a credential. They are used to recognize learning and achievement. Now, if you're going to do that, you're pretty much going to have to have some form of an assessment. It might be summative. It might be formative. But you're going to have to have some kind of assessment practices. If you do those two things, you're going to be impacting whether you acknowledge it or not. And you might be impacting motivation in ways that you hadn't thought about. What I was particularly interested in as a person who, I'm an assessment specialist, I do a lot of uh, uh, program evaluations, is that the deliberations that organizations have to go through define what claims they're going to make and what evidence they're going to use to support those claims and what assessments are going to generate those evidence, that evidence. If that works, and it sometimes didn't, you have before you a wealth of evidence about the impact of your program. You literally, if you just have a record of every badge that an organization has issued, all of a sudden, you have a pretty nice, you, you, you can do a lot with it. Not that much was accomplished, but I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that if I have time. What I was really after, though, was what are the intended practices? So we looked at the proposal. We did content analysis to drive. What, what are your intentions? Oh, huh, these five projects all said that they were going to try to award badges for formal credit. Um, then we interviewed them after the projects got underway and said, how's that going? You originally, in your proposal, said you're going to award formal credit. You're going to get external endorsement. Have you succeeded? And then finally, once the funding was over, we did a follow-up final interview to say, OK, what's happening now? Now that you're funding for the badge system, is your, are you still issuing badges, for example? That allowed us, by clustering the practices into more general principles, we were able to derive an initial set of design principles. We literally did a card sort. So we could put them into more general design principles, and we formalized those principles. And that allowed us to then connect those principles to the external research. Right. So for instance, within the motivation literature, we were able to take sets of similar principles and say, OK, now let's, there isn't a large body of research on badges yet, but we know there's a lot of research on incentives. For example, so, and I'm we're we're still working on it. We're still trying to get the final report out. Oh, that's it's been quite a challenging project. To give you an idea of what we have here, is the entire set of principles for uh, recognizing learning, starting ranging ordered by the most prevalent, the most common. So, 23 of the projects had uh, three different types of practices for aligning badges to standards, ranging all the way to the least. Uh, common practice of awarding formal academic credit for badges. So this allowed us to step back and say, which was the hardest thing to do and which was the easiest thing to do? 
So right now, if you go to our website, it's just the design principles documentation part. It goes just scat of data that we have these detailed, uh, you know, there's about 11 or 12 pages there about each project talking about how the project succeeded. We've added these um, uh, prefaces to them to say, you know, this data collection ended at the end of 2014, but here's what's happened since 2014. For instance, 4-H, their badge system really didn't take. They built a new badge system since then. So we want to acknowledge what they did. So tons of data. So right now, I'm presenting what we learned in terms of the phrase where badges work better. One of the findings was that badges work better in some places than others. You can see on the left that only uh, 16 of the projects were judged to have built the uh, badge system that they proposed. Uh, and only 11 projects were judged, even though they built that badge system, ended up with the ecosystem that they envisioned. These were judgment calls. Importantly, five of the projects never built a badge system at all. And seven of them, we judged, never really built any sort of ecosystem. Manufacturers, Institute, for example, uh, they, they got their badge system up and running. But because they were unable to secure external endorsement from the employers for those badges, it never took. So second conclusion is badges work better where content and technology already exist. If you look on the left, you can see the 10 projects that all only had to build badges because they already had technology, a website, and they already had content. Uh, the majority of them succeeded. Uh, and the badges plus technology were right. So the, the point is, is if you already have your content, it's a lot easier to build a badge system. Over there on the right, you see those projects that had to build the badges and the technology and the content were mostly unsuccessful. And that's not a big surprise, but it's a bit of a cautionary tale. So for example, Microsoft Partners in Learning was a badges only site. They were layered. However, because they already had their technology, their website, they couldn't remake it sufficiently to issue digital badges. So in that respect, yes, they succeeded in building a badge system, but not an open badge system. So there's a bunch of trade-offs there that, in this data. You also, uh, they had to scrap, they had to literally rebuild their website. Uh, SANFS, who I'll return to uh, Sustainable Agriculture and Food Safety, they, um, they were so ambitious. There was just no way, way they were going to accomplish this with just that funding. So here's where it gets good. This is the fun stuff. Because the obvious way to make badges valued by learners and employers would be to get external value. Or external endorsements. Four out of the ten projects uh, attempted to secure external endorsements for their badges. Six of them failed for various reasons. But for instance, 3D Game Lab, you'll notice their badges at the bottom. They say NOAA Planet Steward. They invested huge energy in just being able to call them NOAA badges. And NOAA had a lot of oversight, but they wouldn't let them use the logo. Uh, two out of eight use different non-formal endorsements. Only two out of the eight who attempted to secure what we judge to be external value succeeded. So for example, of those six projects, uh, they failed to gain those external endorsements for different reasons. Who built America? And the National Council for Social Studies, they just didn't get badges. So their teacher badges, they, they proceeded. They, they were very successful. Jim Diamond at EDC has done a fabulous job. The National Manufacturing Badge System said that their manufacturers, they understood badges, but they basically said, show us somebody who's earned this badge who can do the job, and we'll get on board. It's a chicken and egg problem. 4-H was an interesting project. They built a badge system that essentially replicated their existing social network, uh, their existing uh, credentials, ribbons, and trophies. And they already had a social network in terms of their after-school clubs and their county fairs. So when they ran into problems getting their system up and running, people recognized that this, there's really no value added. One of the big takeaways is don't issue redundant badges. We succeeded getting badges up in edX. They're certificate badges. They're literally course completion badges. So, so I'm going to talk about this finding a lot more this afternoon. This is the one that's most interesting to me. Badges work better where learning is social and network. Two of these projects, by our judgment, were extremely successful. Supporter to Reporters Medals in the UK was a youth journalism project. Supporters are fans in the UK. So let's take the, turn these kids into sports reporters and try to keep them from turning into soccer hooligans. Um, tremendously successful by every account. Uh, badge system, uh, thousands of badges, 
teachers uh, accepting them for credit, even though they didn't formalize that practice. So, you know, I'll be a much deeper dive into that this afternoon. And then Mouse wins. The point is, both of these awarded badges for learning that was primarily social and network, and their badges included these participation badges. Which some people derive as attendance badges. Many of the badges included, they didn't include competencies. They said they worked, they did something. Not Now, they included more specific competencies, but they started with more general statements of what the person did. Um, additionally, though, they layered badges into existing content and technology. Quite conversely, five of these projects explicitly represented themselves as competency-based programs. Level Up, a very ambitious effort in uh, K-12 system in Colorado, never got off the ground. They were just crushed under. The, the, and the problem with my report is they say failure is an orphan. So it's really hard to get people to talk about what really happened. Um, so that's been a big challenge, but I'm trying to do right by them to say what lessons can we learn without pointing fingers. Um, sustainable agriculture and food safety was a, a lot of press. It was it is very, very ambitious portfolio assessment system. And no way, way too ambitious, could not do it, couldn't make this transition from a credit hour to competency system. Pathways to global competence for reasons that nobody's been able to explain to me yet um, fully. They're, they're characterizing in terms of funding. It was Asia Society. This was one of the Gates Foundation grantees. Again, a very, they spent a lot of time and a lot of money coming up with a pretty extensive list of competencies. And there just wasn't bandwidth left to put the thing in place. It just didn't happen. Manufacturers Institute, as I mentioned, had this sort of chicken and egg problem. Um, the also Young Adult Library Services Administration, I, I mentioned that they had to remake their badge. And, their, their system, and part of it is they just dumped all of the specific competencies and went back to one single completion badge. So this uh, this is what I'll be doing over my Thanksgiving break, because it's now you're overdue. As you can imagine, it's a difficult this is a difficult thing to write up because just getting the data right has been an enormous challenge. To say, for example, to say, well, what do you do with national with the Manufacturers Institute with that practice? If the badge system works, they've formalized the practice, but nobody's using it. Right, a lot, a lot of judgment calls like that. It's really been, was quite a, so, um, so I have time for some questions um, before we move on. My next, next I'm gonna talk about this new project, but I wonder if people have questions about uh, the previous. And let me say, for those online, uh, just go ahead and type your question in the chat box. I'll relay them. Uh, for those of you that are in the room, please uh, just take a moment and uh, grab the mic from Larry uh, for any questions you have. But while we're letting some, some people think uh, about some of their questions, um, one of the things that I was, I was interested in is you, you mentioned about the lack of pickup in a few different uh, areas, one of them being business. Uh, or hi those who are doing hiring. And what I was wondering was, did you get any sense of, or have you gotten any sense of why there is, there has been this lag? Is it inertia? Is it lacking confidence in the meaning of these badges and assessments that we're doing? Between? Is it the organizations that are issuing these badges? And that uh, an organization such as a Penn State or a, or a Indiana University has not stepped up and issued these badges? Yeah, I'll come back to that some with the new project because it is higher ed, so we yeah. have a much, it's, Surely higher ed, so we're getting a much better sense of the employer landscape. Part of it is, is the people that people were just figuring out how to do this, and they were just figuring out how to get the evidence and the badges. So, for instance, if you're working with a learning management system, all of the student work is kind of password. Huge, yeah. huge challenge. So, um, I really was impressed. I was down uh, uh, Australia's very ambitious undertaking. And uh, we were down for a national forum that, uh, that they organized uh, last November. And they brought in uh, someone from a, a, a hiring official from the largest telecom institute. And she said, I look at 600 resumes a week. That's part of what I was wondering. But what she said was, when we start winnowing down, you betcha we go to LinkedIn. You betcha we go to Facebook. We start looking at these people, and we're beginning to recognize that the badges on your LinkedIn are the things that matter. So, you know, but she said, you just don't ever forget that. I look at 600 resumes a week. 
So when I talked about this tacit networks, I, I talked with a few deans and I've talked with a few, a, a lot of companies about this. What they learn is that they get their first graduate of a program and they really rake them over the coals. They send them through eight or nine interviews and they watch them like hawks and make sure they can do the job. And then the next person who comes, oh, okay, this, 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 the, the, you know, they, they learn whose recommendations to trust. So these, these tacit networks run throughout hiring and these relationships. To me, that's the bigger issue. Yes. And one of the things I've always wondered is, so there's developing the system for issuing the badges, mapping them kind of season, and endorsing them. There's another on the hiring side of being able to sort through this information. We're yeah. providing an enormous amount of information uh, to these hiring managers that, that they have to sit through, and they're used to doing it one way. Exactly. Now we're asking exactly. them to do it in Well, the real exciting thing to me is the idea that you can drill, right? The same way that an employer does this with someone who comes to them. Well, if, when I show you, you know, some of my badges, I've really been able to push the limits of evidence rich. Yeah. Well, you go, oh, that's interesting. What's that? Click. Oh, click. Oh, click. And you can go back and back and back. I would imagine, and I'm seeing a little bit of this, that once you've drilled all the way down into somebody's badge, then the next time you see that same badge, you don't drill it. Far, and the next time you get the badge, you say, "Oh, another one of those." Great. Yeah. So that's gonna that, that, that's gonna take a while. Question. I have a question regarding running small experiments to get badges moving because it, it seems like it's quite a leap for many people to to go from a degree or even a course completion, three credit course, to badges or micro credits where you're looking at several small pieces within a single course. And I found a lot of reluctance to go that direction, in part because I don't understand the value of it. How do we um, get those in administration to uh, to allow us to run badge experiments? And what do those experiments look like? What's the Mayo saying? The big, start small, work. Um, I, I, I just couldn't enough. If you want to, the, the, the big move in badges, and I'll, I'll come back to this, are pathways or, or, or playlists. Just start with one piece of your pathway, one badge. Think of that as a part of a bigger thing. Get that one working and get your technology working and, and, and make things happen. And then figure out and then adjust and refine. Then make another badge just like that one for the next module. Get build slowly. And then all of a sudden you've got your and then you've got your course badge. But also you really want to try not to replicate the existing system. You really want to find ways to get evidence that doesn't lend itself to conventional assessment practices. You want to get evidence of participation in those badges, things that you can't represent. If you're just duplicating the existing credentialing system, it's too much work. And that system's already in place. Thanks. We have, we have a question on Arlen. Actually, Kyle Peck uh, is asking, uh, what's the status of the endorsements field in digital badges? Uh, he saw a white paper under development, but has it been implemented? Yet? Yeah, great question, Kyle. Um, yeah, Deb Everhart's paper is in a uh, book that Zane Baird, who's got a chapter in it as well, that's coming out. I believe that's due any day. Deb is uh, Deb is working with us I'm on a project with the American Council on Ed on stackable digital credentials more broadly. Um, what's really exciting. Let me actually let me return to that question. I'm actually the, one of those questions. I'll, I'll I'll answer that question later, Kyle. Sure. Uh, well, we move to one other uh, online okay. question. It's been up there for a bit. Uh, Dana Brinkle is asking. I would develop uh, one badge that would be certified by an association that's connected to. Or I'm sorry, Holly is asking. Do you find that gamification of education or training supported by the buy-in of badges, or if it's uh, diminished as more informal for competency-based learning? Mm. Ooh. Um, gamification is fine when you're doing just-in-time learning, right? The reason gamification, the reason games are so motivating is because you're constantly being asked to learn something and use it immediately. And most of us are engaged in what Alan Collins called just-in-case learning. Necessarily, when you set up a formal educational system, you're preparing students for a bunch of eventualities. Gamification becomes really problematic. You get these. I mean, the over-justification effect is very real. And Alfie Cohn and I finally got to debate Alfie on this topic. I said, well, don't use badges in that way, and it won't be a problem. He didn't quite see eye to eye with me on that. But um, if you give people extrinsic, 
uh, arbitrary incentives for things that they already enjoy doing. Their free time is going to fill it out. A thousand studies, we know that. So, um, you know, there are a lot of gamified approaches to badges, class badges and stuff, and, you know, they just become the gold stars, and if gold stars are working for you, um, then badges are going to work for you. You know, you want to be on the lookout for the, the various negatives. Yeah, but getting at the challenges, we, we, we responded to Alfie with this. We have a paper that we're trying to finish with two uh, of my colleagues in the project, um, by Shanky and Kathy Tran. Um, a kind of a point by point, eight point response to the kinds of concerns that Alfie raised. And the first and foremost is just don't do that with badges. You know, there's no reason to put arbitrary extrinsic incentives in, in the badge. But what I think someone should do, a great dissertation right now, is to get somebody to replicate the over Badges, or, or to, 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 you could really easily manipulate the nature and the uh, valence of the incentives in the badges and control everything else. And I think we could do a pretty good study of revisit that. Sure. Yeah, my, my question has to go um, to do with going back to the issues with uh, different organizations that that weren't ready to accept this as a as a schema for credentialing, um, whether it be it's, it doesn't seem to be valid or understand the concept. Um, what I'm running into is the difficulty. It's a semiotic thing, really. The, uh, when we badge, people have a lot of baggage associated with the term itself. And but as soon as they start to call it a credential, then it's like, oh well, I know what that is. So I, I wonder if a lot of our problem is, is just the nomenclature itself. Because I, um, one of my PhD colleagues, Mary Meehan, she's the current president at Alverno College. But they've been doing competency-based or ability-based education for years, right? Um, they don't give grades out. <laughs> Yet their students go on to have very successful careers. They go to um, graduate schools and things like that. So people know how to deal with that sort of information. Um, so I'm wondering if, if, if we're, we just need to switch up the nomenclature of what we're doing. Boy, we've been, so Carla Casili um, is now with IMS Global. Carla was a central figure in the, the Mozilla Foundation. She's with IMS Global and she's leading up three really influential teams developing currency frameworks around digital badges. And we we're, I'm actually missing the meeting tomorrow because I'm here. But um, we spent a lot of time talking about this. Um, the, the very notion of the micro-credential, that's why we're, we're putting such an emphasis on patent, because if you have micro-credentials that clearly stack up to this value badge. So, yeah, um, uh, Karen Cater, formerly the Director of Educational Technology for the US DOE, is a digital promise. They do not utter the word badges. It's all either micro-credentials, digital credentials. The term that um, is coming out of the project that we're working on with the American Council on Education, the Gates is one of the connected credentials. A very nice paper called Connecting Credentials uh, at CLASP that really dives deeply into these issues. So it's, I don't have the answers. I'm not sure, uh, but you know, badges is what we started with, so we're sticking with that for now. But it's a, we spent a lot of time talking about it. It's anecdotal, but I was uh, participating in a uh, pre conference session at OLC down in Orlando few weeks ago and we had a breakout session on digital badging and I mentioned the idea of micro-credentialing as, as a, a term for specific use of digital badges and it turned the conversation immediately and each person at the table, about 10 of us at the table in this breakout and each at the table said I am taking that back and, and using this term when pitching it for their particular use. Now I think that yeah. it's a much more specific term. Uh, but I found it very interesting the the response that was received upon using that. Yeah, technology. I've um, I've taken some heat from my colleagues. Uh, that, you know, it's oh, it's just this trendy, fluffy thing. It's like no, there's a lot more going on here. Yeah. Um, but but uh, MacArthur called them badges, and so yeah, we stuck with that. But it, it is an open question. We're in I think we have time for one more, and then okay. in interest of time, we'll get back to your presentation. Um, this is more <clears throat> just a comment as well, but I was talking about badges last year, and I realized they're actually culturally uh, disrespectful to people because people hear the term, people from 
oppressed countries uh, hear the term, heard the term badges, and it immediately brought them back to really negative connotations of crime and government and authority figures. And so that's really, you know, really I, I am I'm struck by the fact that I've never heard someone say that like that, and I kind of I can totally see that. Yeah, that's yeah. that's that, that um, conversation more than any of the others about yeah or gamey or whatever really made me think about why we are naming them. Oh, it's a different. I'm so tired of the meat, those stinking badges joke. Um, <laughs> we're at the point now where where we can make it through a whole session on badges without a badges joke. But that's yeah, yeah. I can see that. That's a really really good point. That would carry that. It's a, it's, it's definitely it's a Western. And, and almost an American concept to Boy Scouts, which are you know a semi-fascist organization anyway. So you know, I didn't really think that but a lot of people think it is. A lot of people argue it is. It certainly has a, some serious issues with gender orientation. So thank you. Okay, one more. So what term are we saying might be effective in the end? We can mention the I, badges, I'm but what other I'll go out on a limb here and say that I think this connected credentials, this work we're doing with the American Council on Ed, uh, Evan Gans Glass, and Deb Everhart, of formerly of Black, were really pushing on the notion of connected credentials. And, and it's starting to resonate with a lot of people. So um, I think, and that's an umbrella that we can say that badges are a form of connected credentials, but it doesn't exclude uh, other forms. So the open. Badges in Higher Education Project. Uh, this is uh, this is my newer MacArthur project. We're about halfway through a two-year project. And we've been funded really to support the whole ecosystem. And as I say to the people who contact us asking for help, um, I ain't no genius, and this ain't no genius grant. We're pretty much get get free. You know, we 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 were, we have the trust of the foundation, and have just been asked to to to, to help wherever we can. We started. Uh, the, the big push was to get badges up and running in edX.org and open edX, and that has been successful. Um, and now we're literally just working with, with people who reach out to us or who we reach out to to um, help move the ecosystem forward. James Willis is my project coordinator on this. Joshua Quick and Strategy from John and Donnie are both my students of genius our research. And we're, we're, we're cataloging, we're trying to keep track of now hundreds of open badge education and higher education projects. We're working closely with about a dozen, uh, aiming to get two or three either internal or externally funded proposals in place uh, next year when the, the OBAG project funding runs out. We're just meeting with them. We spend about about 10 hours a week on Google Hangout, you know, checking back with people, putting helping people find resources and partners. And then cataloging that information. So if you go to Google, open badges in higher education. We're the ones right below Pearson. Um, and uh, you can learn about the projects. You can meet the people who are there. You can uh, hear their thoughts on what they've done. You can learn about events. You can learn about, for instance, the bi weekly uh, community call that we run. We're also the coordinators. I'm the co coordinator of the uh, EduCause constituency group. So we're just trying to shepherd. This community forward. It's an open call. It's a great place if you want to come. Now we're at the point we're getting a little overloaded. So now we're, we're to the point where we're scheduling calls with people going into December and then asking them to join the weekly, the bi weekly calls. Or there's three different uh, regular open community calls for batches that they can join. It's a really great place for people to, 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 to join the community and work for a while. Um, uh, our blog, Remediating Assessment, has lots of stuff, tons of stuff, really. Um, this is a pretty good uh, repository of papers, where you can see some of your colleagues there. Um, so we are still taking on new projects. We're kind of slowing down a little bit, because we are getting, getting pretty involved with quite a few projects. Um, so I'd like to take a minute now and talk about the current set. There's been a lot of changes afoot that have occurred in the field, but I think very important for people who are interested. One is the, the you know this biggest development is uh, thanks to Nate Otto, who uh, is my former project coordinator, who's now at Concentric Sky. Um, uh, and there you can see uh, that's Lorena Barba, uh, Miguel uh, Amigo, uh, and uh, Anat Argual from edX celebrating the. Or finally, I mean, 
edX is one messy piece of code. It's about 700,000 lines. So it's really, really messy code. It's never been rewritten. So it was a lot of work to get them up and running. Nonetheless, all we have there now are, are course badges. There are no module badges yet. So it's, it's slow going, but they picked it up. They're running with it. So we're really happy about that. How many of you know what, know what LTI stands for? No? Learning tools interoperability? So, OK. So let's, I'm going to take a step back here. And this is a really, really important thing about learning management systems. Um, one of the reasons that my university, who launched Sakai, the open source platform, on course in our case, in Michigan, and it, it, it was not LTI compliant. Right? If you wanted to make a change to, to on course, you had to change the core code. And this was done in an open source fashion. So it's a very complex piece of code. Nobody, there was no one person who knew how the whole thing operated. I watched a company almost bankrupt themselves trying to build in a simple I rubric tool. Now, LTI is for LMSs, what external apps are for everything else. It's a major shift in programming, right? Your phone, right? When you add an external app, you're not changing the core code at all. You're adding an app that has been designed to talk with your operating system, your phone. And LTI does that for learning management systems. The reason that my university dumped, on, dumped Sakai and went with this was because they just, there was no will to rewrite that system. So Canvas, B2L, uh, Blackboard, those are all LTI compliant. So if you want to add badges to them, you build an external app that is LTI compliant, and it can talk to it. That means that the, in this case, Badge Safe, Badger, and Credly all have built. Nate Otto will be doing a webinar for Canvas shortly. Um, there's not that much once you've got that system up and running in Canvas. It's it's almost no work then to make that system work in Blackboard. More importantly, your badges are not in the LMS. Right? So you're not locking your stuff in the LMS. You're also not putting your content that you might want to put in a badge inside the LMS. So this is a game changer. This is going to be big. Um, the shift to this learning tools interoperability. As we'll talk about this afternoon, though, what that means, though, is the standards for making that happen lock in assumptions about and what counts as learning and what labels as learning and how it's labeled. So it's a very important time for us to be thinking about what are assumptions once we standardize these things. So I'm really excited about uh, what's happening in the e-portfolio space. So my doctoral student, Kirsten Pellstrom, is going on Monday to the regional meeting in uh, Georgia of the American Association for Experiential and Evidence-Based evidence -based Learning, which is essentially the e-portfolio organization. Um, I'll be presenting at the AACNU e-portfolio forum in February, and then the regional meeting in Notre Dame in the spring that Alex Ambrose and Notre Dame is organizing. We'll have a major strand of badges in portfolios. And the reason that I'm excited about this is because portfolios really, right, they, they have this tension between their formative functions for supporting learning, their transformative functions for, for creating ecosystems of learners around those artifacts, and then the summative functions for, for accountability. That's a big challenge for portfolios. And badges, as I mentioned earlier, can serve as boundary objects. And in particular, the thing that I'm most excited about, I hope to have uh, this up and running by the end of our project, is that a badge can live alongside a portfolio. And the, 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 earner, the owner of that badge can choose to stack that badge inside of an LMS by simply pasting the URL for the badge in the LMS, where grades, feedback, instructor feedback can be added within a FERPA protected space. So the badge can still live out there attract comments, attract attention, get curated in some other system, and the link to it is what lives inside the LMS that has to be protected because it's graded student information. And this is what I meant by saying that badges can serve as boundary objects, carry this information back and forth and, 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 and connect learners and employers and educators in the ways that web-enabled evidence can do, but then they can be stacked inside of, for instance, a competency mapping system in your LMS. So I'm really excited. About, we, we hope to get several papers out about that. We'll also, in the final report, 
uh, we uh, will focus in very closely on the several projects that were portfolio oriented in the uh, project I talked about earlier. Uh, the evolving landscape. So uh, many of you may know that MacArthur has gotten out of the education business and recently has got their severance package. Um, Connie Yowell has started a new organization that is called Collective Shift. It's a $25 million startup from MacArthur. It was just formally announced just a few weeks ago. We've known that it was coming for a long time. Project LRNG is the rebranding of cities of learning. Um, if you want to see some really impressive new thinking about competency-based instruction, check out the Pittsburgh, what they're doing in Pittsburgh, what Sprout Fund is doing in Pittsburgh. I was going to put them in my slides, and it, it was too new to me, and it was too long. Really thoughtful work happening around badges, around stuff like early childhood education, uh, robotics, and stuff. So, a lot happening there that's really interesting to look forward to. The Badge Alliance has been reorganized. Nate Otto is now the director of Badge Alliance. Nate is is has picked up the work that Mozilla started. Um, you know, Mozilla did just a tremendous job building these prototypes of Kit and um, the backpack. Um, and just more work needed to be done. And Nate is now doing that work at, um, at his company where he works for in Oregon. Um, he is hiring uh, new community managers. So really exciting developments. The board of directors of the Badge Alliance now consists of Connie Owl, Mark Sherman from Mozilla, and Robin Abel from IMS Global. IMS Global is a really important player because they're the ones who are developing all of these standards. For instance, the LTI standards I mentioned earlier. That is a, a, a trademark product of IMS Global. Carla Seeley is currently defining this currency framework. So a lot of really important decisions are making. Lots of great stuff is happening. Digital Me, the project who did the Supporter to Reporters Medals project I talked about that I'll talk about a lot more later, just on Tuesday released Open Badge Academy, which is a very promising system. That's in the UK. And finally, um, I should preface this talk by saying I'm a psychologist. I don't even know HTML. So a lot of this stuff is just magic to me. But badges currently are written in JavaScript object notation. I think that's the right word. So the shift to JSON LD linked data is going to be a really important development. Um, uh, Terry Lemoy, Matt, uh, and, and uh, Nate have been working very close on this. This is the subject of standards call each week. Because LD will allow badges that are out on the web to find each other. That's like I said, it's magic. I don't understand. But the idea that badges could stack into a pathway on the open web based on the information in the badges autonomously, that's a pretty. So we're moving from interoperability to extensibility. Not only are they interoperable with all the current systems, they're extensible to a whole bunch of future systems that we haven't even envisioned. That, that kind of blows my mind when I think about it too much. So. Where are we out on time? OK. Um, let me go ahead and get to the end of the question. So um, I've been blessed with the support of my university, uh, a grant from Google, um, and the ability to use the MacArthur money for the badges elements of these courses, my own courses. Um, I've been doing these things at home, books, big open online courses. Um, I don't know what I've been working on in my small face-to-face -face classes to massive scale yet. And I don't want to lock in anything. I want to do sort of very nimble, iterative refinement. So I got a $50,000 grant from Google in 2013 to mod their course builder platform. It's 5,000 beautiful clean lines of Python that my programmer just went to town with. Thomas did an amazing job with it. And I took my assessment class that I've been teaching for many years and offered it as an open course uh, for anybody who wanted to take it. Um, I'll talk about that course this afternoon, but then this summer, I wanted to bring that model and try to accomplish that in Canvas. So the course I taught this summer was called um, An Introduction to Educational Data Sciences. Um, and in this course, I uh, built on a paper that Bill Piety and I wrote uh, with MJ Bishop for the Learning and Analytics Knowledge Fund in 2014, where we advanced this idea that, that Let's take a broader umbrella notion of educational data sciences and see what, what does that look like? What's the landscape? And you can really identify learning analytics and, and educational data mining are two distinct communities. They have two, two journals, two conferences, two different presidents, uh, two different communities. And then what's, what, what 
what else is out? So academic and institutional analysis is the outgrowth of institutional research in higher ed. You've got all of this work happening of schools, K-12 schools, with funding from the feds and Gates trying to figure out what on earth to do with all of this achievement data. And then you have this personalized learning. So we're arguing these are kind of five distinct areas that make up this discipline of educational data sciences. And each week we read a, 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 sig a signature paper um, and typically had the author of that paper in as a guest discussion. So the badges that we issue that I want to focus on today, we use a badge check, which is made out of new pathway builder. Um, and this is what you earn, regardless of whether if you enrolled for credit, you got a regular graduate credit. Clinton, in this case, did was a PhD student in informatics. Um, but he also earned this badge. And this is what we mean when we say evidence-rich badges. This is the course badge. And he earned this badge because he earned all five of the uh, module badges. And this is a this is the educational data mining. So uh, the, the formatting needs work here, but um, this is literally the first time that we use Nate's search system in Canvas. We had to do a lot of things in prototype. I'll talk about this a lot more this afternoon. As I said, in the context of this course, this individual demonstrated midway down on the right, demonstrated the ability to articulate and discuss the following aspects of educational data mining. Articulate and discuss are not on this taxonomy. Now, my other ones I'll show later did include formal assessments and did include statements of more conventional competency. I want to say, this individual at the bottom, this individual also demonstrated the ability to locate additional articles or other resources about EDM and EDM ethics that were directly relevant to the professional context of the This evident, The evidence of the competency of the, rec are the references included in the Wikifolio. When you click on the evidence link, you go to the Wikifolio. This is this open interactive document that students are all able, and once you register for the course, you can see everybody's work. And here you can see Clinton reiterating his background, articulating the EDS challenge that he used to contextualize his engagement in EDS. This is a summary, in this case, of Ryan Baker's first article in the first issue of Educational Data Mining. Here you see the three resources that he located and why he thinks those are relevant. There's his refined challenge, a reflection uh, on his own engagement and his discussion. And it turns out that Ryan Baker was the guest discussed this week. So here you see this being participating in this discussion. So again, this is what we mean by evidence-rich badges and the evidences of their participation and their interaction with their peers. So the course badge contains these five badges. And each of these five badges contains all the work that the students did. In the, uh, because we didn't have any formal assessments, uh, that's as far as we went with that. But in the case where we do have exams, the students choose to include uh, of their own accord whether they want to put their performance, on, whether they met some criteria. That is no longer for protective. So all of this information, we, we, we do keep it private, but it is not for protective. It is not graded student work. Now, my university has been tremendous in this. They basically said, go forth, innovate. Play by the, you know, talk to the attorneys, talk to the registrar, talk to the purpose question. We might tell you you can't do something, but you won't get in trouble. We're very supportive. We wrap up with so Sandy Stringfellow was getting her, her doctorate at San Francisco, uh, University of San Francisco in education, where they didn't have any courses in educational data sciences. And she was just a tremendous participant. She was the open participant. She was the one who really, really shined. She was just, uh, she was just meant to her. Thesis, I believe. And there you can see her badges on uh, her LinkedIn page. When we got, we we're working closely with Instructure to get the learning analytics. So we're, 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 because we're part of this Unison consortium. We, I believe, we, this data dump from this course is some of the very first analytics that have come out. And of course, we did a social network analysis and confirmed what we knew all along. The Sadia really was in the middle of things there. And in fact, she was the only person who was more engaged uh, with the class. Like you can see, her little circle is bigger than mine. She came up with this new badge uh, so that we awarded to Sandy. She's on the job market. She wants to get a job in educational data sciences. And we called it the participatory engagement badge. So and this is what we mean by evidence-rich badges that contain evidence of 
all kinds of stuff. This is what I'll talk about much more in depth today. This is this is the badge that you earn in my assessment course. And again, here you see, you put that image up there on the upper right, it appears in your Facebook page. Somebody clicks on that, it comes to this page, and they can click on each of those smaller badges and go to literally all of the student work. So that's, I believe that's the end of my slides. Yes, there's some more information. We've got quite a few papers uh, out there in the usual places, but also at our website. So uh, well, I'm sure we have questions in the room. But one that came up online, actually two that came up in line, I'm going to bring them together. Uh, we had an online participant ask the, a, a bit of a functional question of, you know, where is this data stored? But Kyle came in as you were talking about the, uh, the Wikifolio. Is that still modifiable after, at this point? And if that is linked in as the evidence, what is the concern there for the storing in perpetuity of this evidence, particularly at scale? Uh, as soon as you have a university doing this, and you have Sir, video and the concern uh, in the case of the edX, uh, I I use some of my grant funds to support achievery uh, to do the badges in edX, and they decide to put in the badge. We're just making sure they store it. So that's a big issue. But that's a big issue with all student work, right? As as uh, so, yeah, we're we're definitely working on that. That's a, one of the biggest issues. Basis. How do you keep this stuff live? Um, I think that one of the one of the safeguards is is let's not make that the only if it's a formal credit. But I don't, you know, it, it's a tough call. Like right now, Sandy worked very hard in my class. She has no credential of that course. All she has is a badge. And if you know, right now, I mean, those are literally Google Docs. Yeah. So that's that's. What I'm hoping to focus on, both in my own work and in the field going forward. Very, very important question. So, Dan, I've got I've got a, a myriad of questions, as you might guess, um, but I want to lead off with this one related to this topic. Is there space in this um, aggregation or archiving of my work? So, let's say I'm taking your course, I'm doing my for me to define what is viewable, what is not. So Absolutely. One, it's one thing to get the badge. It's another thing to say, well, I wrote my paper on a very specific financial model here at Penn State that I'm really not, I don't want someone drilling down and being exactly. able to see. So when we first put the badges out in Course Builder in 2013, we defaulted to including the student wiki folios. Well, it turns out that I had several students who were quite critical of their institutions and their work. They were railing against their institutions. They were working overseas in, 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 in Saudi Arabia, actually. Whoa, wait a minute. I can't circulate that badge. I didn't, you know, we were just you know, we were just flying by the seat of our pants then. So so those badges, um, you get to choose to include peer promotions. So for example, Marina Michael, one of my former students, a Fulbright student, uh, earned the course badge and she she really wanted to get these peer promotions where you because you can only promote one and only one each week is being exemplary. And because she was a school teacher, my practice of alerting everyone to the early posters. They were drawing all of the, of the peer promotions, and so she couldn't get them. And she really, really wanted it. And she finally earned, got more of the, those endorsements than any else in her group. And her version of the badge said leader on it and said that she had earned more promotions. But she's a Cypriot. She said, Cypriots are modest. We wouldn't put that up there. So she chose not to include the text of the promotions. So you can control uh, whether or not you say you met criteria in the exam, your completed work, and the peer promotions. There's another answer to that, though, and that is, is you get to aggregate, you get to annotate uh, and curate. So you get to say what you did, and, and you, the learners get to control, right? You're the one who decides whether you share it out over Facebook. I don't, if they don't share, if they don't claim their badge, no one ever sees it. But if they don't claim the badge, it, it lives in my system, and it's up to them to choose to claim that badge. And then where to share it, and where to stack it, and who to share it. So in that case, I could I could annotate to say I developed a financial business model for let's just say an online course. Um, for more information, contact me privately, and but I don't have to put it all out there. So that's I like yeah. That. Likewise, we, we I always encourage students, especially the doctoral students, to take their work that they've assembled and then put it into a term paper, and that's an extra. Well, that's the only way you get an A, a plus in my classes by getting those extra points for that. Likewise, they get to add information to that to explain, to give context. And that's that's a really important thing that agency 
that the earner has over what information is in the badge, how it's shared. That is a huge difference from the existing system. You get an F, you get an F. And that F is there. Right, so th there's a... So do you have, um, Brad, I don't want to take all of the... So, so you gave me a great idea just now, because this is something I've been struggling with from the beginning, and, and I've shared with you earlier. I have put badges on top of a leadership development program yeah, yeah. I've been working on. And um, the, my first attempt to do the badging was strictly around sort of participation show up. You showed up for the, the we'll call it the primer, and we'll give you a badge. And you showed up at the immersion experience, we'll give you a badge, and so forth. Man, didn't didn't mean much. Now, what I took away from your earlier comments was, it's a start. But don't throw that out. That's not a bad thing. It, it just doesn't have a lot of weight. And, and other than participation and being there, breathing, I'd like to say, you, you get the Well, point. let's distinguish between participation and attendance. Okay. That's my big issue with the field. This is attendance is a very different thing than what I would characterize as engaged participation. If you have evidence of their engaged participation, especially their disciplinary participation, that's very different than this, what I've been labeling as carpet badging. You know, sure. Show up at a conference and catch, or what Serge Rebecca calls and pray. Spray the badges and hope people care. Don't do that. So, but what you just said about three minutes ago just kind of like hit me. I thought, well, okay, if I do the participation badge, which is a fairly low bar, right? Um, you, you came to the program, you participated. Um, what I could be doing better, I think, is asking for that last piece of evidence. So if you attended for the primer, for example, this online where we have introductions and some discussions, um, make, make a reflection upon it, uh, leave something behind so we know what that meant to you. If you did the immersion program, same thing. That's something I didn't think about doing, so I appreciate that. Yeah, you want to make people do something to get the badge, too. You don't want to just give them the badge. You want to make them contribute something so that they have some ownership over that evidence, so that they participated in that somehow. And then you want them to actually go and claim the badge. You don't want to push the badges out. You want them to immediately recognize that they have some ownership and some control over that credential. I love the idea of owner agency in that, by the way. I think that's terrific. So we have time for one question. I don't have any online. So are there any uh, questions in-house here? Otherwise, we actually are at time. But I figured we'd give one more chance for So when you do and create your badges and issue them in the classes, do you, after the classes are over, have you gone back in and edited the badges at all to change the assignments or any confusion that students may well, have? Well, certainly the, 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 the wiki folios are live. And as I'll talk about this afternoon, we've now, my assessment course is now fully self-paced. You can go in and find people who are currently working or who previously worked who have said that they will interact. So you literally, you took the course previously, Someone comes in and puts a comment, and you archive it this way. You get an email saying, hey, somebody just commented on you. So that comment will be added, and it's, it's linking to the thing. So it's the badge, the, the work doesn't exist. It's just a link. So if you continue to edit your work, revise your paper, that, all of that new work will be shown. Yeah. Do you, do you go in and change your badges at all once you have them out there, like in terms of the, what's required of the students? Uh, no, I would say I don't. I think we kind of let them live. Yeah, I want to add something back to that point you made earlier. It really got me thinking about that issue. Um, Ugochi Analu, who's been very central in the Cities of Learning work with Nicole Pinkert um, in Chicago, has really looked at some of these issues. I mean, yeah, you know, I, I realize now that the, the issue you raised has been raised in a somewhat different way. And I, I like her line that the, the, one of the equity issues we're seeing is, is that Access is not equity. That, that one of the big thrusts that we're addressing those kind that, that people are thinking about those concern that you raise is that there are a lot of people out there who just think, hey, this is going to just open up learning, and that's going to and that'll be equitable. And her point is, is access alone does not equal equity. Yeah, well, it's like the access rainbow from School Night in Canada. They talk about that. Yeah. Too. So, okay. So with that, I want to say thank you very much for joining us again. Maybe next November, December, we'll have you back one more time.